Imagine you're being chased. You're speeding on a busy road trying to escape a maniac who, for whatever reason, decided that you were going to be their victim today. Your heart is beating fast, your eyes are hyper-focused on the road, and your digestive system shuts down, leaving your mouth as dry as a Sahara. Finally, you see a cop car and flag them down. The carjacker that was tailing you blows past you and you're safe and sound. The stress is over and your sympathetic nervous system calms down and takes a backseat to your parasympathetic nervous system. This biological shift is normal and life-saving as it directs all of your body's resources towards keeping you alive in the face of a threat. The stress response becomes problematic, however, when we're stressed all of the time. For many people, constant stress is a trigger for emotional eating. If you're one of these people, then you should definitely keep watching to find out how stress connects to emotional eating, why dieting is not the answer, and my tips for what you should actually do to combat emotional eating effectively. Now, when you hear the word emotional eater, what probably comes to mind for you is a woman sitting by herself eating a tub of ice cream. But let's not forget that men also experience emotional eating too. Binge eating is often intertwined with emotional eating, and it's commonly seen in people who are at an unhealthy weight like Tammy from Thousand Pound Sisters. But keep in mind that not every person who feels trapped by emotional eating is overweight. Many people who appear to have a healthy relationship with food are actually struggling in silence like Patty from Insatiable. So what is really happening when we emotionally eat? Let's do a quick overview of the stress response. When you experience a stressor, the fight or flight system or your sympathetic nervous system takes over. This signals the adrenal glands to release adrenaline, aka epinephrine. This in turn causes the heart to beat more rapidly in order to provide more oxygenated blood to the body, the lungs to become more efficient at taking up oxygen, the senses to sharpen and blood sugar to rise. Stress also activates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal or HPA axis. When this happens, the hypothalamus in the brain sends a signal to the pituitary gland, also part of the brain, who then sends a different signal to the adrenal glands sitting down below on the kidneys who complete the chain by releasing the last signal. This signal is cortisol, the infamous stress hormone. This response is really helpful in stressful situations, but as I mentioned in the beginning, it can become problematic when we are stressed constantly. Waking up after a restless night, drudging through a workday at a job you despise, and coming home to a discordant family situation are just a few things that can cause incessant stress. Constant stress keeps cortisol levels high, and this basically throws your physiology out of whack, causing high blood pressure, high blood sugar, and a host of other negative side effects. But why does stress lead to emotional eating? Well, stressors activate the neural stress response network. This provokes a rise in cortisol and insulin, and these and other hormones act in areas of the brain such as the amygdala that are important for forming memories. Remember, short-term stress actually causes digestion to shut down. It is only when we face repeated stress that we learn to taper down with food that our brains start to associate stress with eating. When we repeatedly engage in this behavior, we basically override our normal physiological response such that stress eating becomes an automatic behavior. Stress also causes increased emotional activity and reduced executive function in the brain. In other words, stress causes our brains to shift into default mode and away from conscious decision mode. And this redirection is reinforced every time we reach for ice cream when we feel anxious. And really, there are layers to this problem. The most obvious or most visible one is that emotional eating can lead to an increased amount of fat around your abdomen. But beyond that, the problem that caused you to emotionally eat in the first place never really goes away. We've all been there, right? You think that a tray of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies will be the thing to lift your spirits, but it never really works, not for more than a few seconds. You don't actually consciously cope with the problem, and so it stays there and just continues to hurt you. Here's another con. Overeating or eating when you're not actually hungry can shorten your lifespan, in theory. Studies that have been done in animals point to caloric restriction being a key to longevity, so overeating may be masking your feelings and keeping you from having more birthdays. 
Now, here's the big question. Is it possible to rewire our brains such that we no longer associate stress with eating? Well, yes. A part of your brain called the nuclei accumbens plays a role in the motivation to carry out certain behaviors, and this motivation can happen at one of two levels, the automatic level via the basal ganglia or the conscious level through the prefrontal cortex. Actually learning how to pause and reassess your feelings whenever you feel the urge to emotionally eat can help to increase activity in the prefrontal cortex and decrease activity in the amygdala. This shift favors more conscious decision-making and potentially better decisions around food. By now you must be wondering, has any research on real human beings been done on this topic? Yes. This paper explores the causes of emotional eating and the authors identified six key factors which often lead to emotional eating that go beyond the stress response that I described earlier. These factors are dieting, poor interoceptive awareness, which is the ability to identify, understand, and respond to your internal biological cues, confusion of hunger and satiety cues with emotions, alexithymia, which is the inability to recognize or describe one's own emotions, a reversed stress response of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and genetic predisposition, for example, with certain variations of the dopamine D2 receptor gene and the serotonin transporter gene. As you can see, emotional eating can be a pretty complicated thing. Nevertheless, the thing I want to emphasize is that dieting is never the answer. As you can see from the list, dieting actually increases your risk of emotional eating. When solving the problem of emotional eating, you want to make sure that the solution actually matches the problem. Therefore, the solution should be to improve emotional recognition, awareness, and regulation. How do we do this? The authors wrote that dialectical behavior therapy, often referred to as DBT, and enhancing mindfulness have both been shown to be effective. Mindfulness is a state of non-judgmental attention to the immediate experience and an acceptance of moment-to-moment -moment experience. The goal of these therapies is to replace automatic unconscious behaviors with more conscious and healthier ones. Several studies have actually been done to assess the effect of mindfulness-based therapies on emotional eating and weight management, and here's what we know so far. In this review of 14 studies, the authors concluded that mindfulness meditation effectively decreases binge eating and emotional eating. However, the findings regarding weight loss were mixed. Considering that many of the studies in this review hovered around two months in duration, I would hypothesize that a longer study duration may be what is needed to actually see weight loss if that is what is desired. This study that came out after the review had a follow-up period of six months and the researchers did observe greater odds of weight loss in people who succeeded in reducing emotional eating. Of course, more research is needed. Now, what about other behavioral factors that may also affect emotional eating? In this seven-year study of about 4,000 Finns, researchers found that depression, exercise, and sleep can affect emotional eating. Depression was found to be strongly linked to emotional eating and increased body mass index and waist circumference over time. Higher physical activity was linked to less emotional eating, and the link between emotional eating and body mass index was lessened in people with a high level of physical activity. Lastly, in people who did not sleep enough, emotional eating was more strongly tied to weight gain. People who got less than 9 hours of sleep had a greater chance of gaining weight because of emotional eating. How much sleep an individual needs can actually vary pretty significantly, but the point here is that sleep deprivation can make it more likely that you'll end up with unwanted weight gain as a result of emotional eating. So what are the main takeaways here? If you have been stuck in a cycle of emotional eating for months or even years, you don't need to go on a diet. What you really want to focus on is digging deeper to find out what is causing you to eat this way in the first place. What difficult emotions are you using food to bury deep within you? When did you learn to use food as an emotional crutch? And when do you notice yourself falling into this pattern? Is it when you're around specific people or in specific situations? Mindfulness can be cultivated with time and practice and getting the help of a professional therapist to help you on your journey could be useful too. Another tip that I have for you that has been useful for me when I feel the urge to emotionally eat is to pause for five to 10 minutes. 
Just waiting a little bit before you get a second helping of food or head out to the ice cream shop can be a very effective strategy and it comes back to being mindful and being connected with what you're actually feeling. When you pause, you give yourself a chance to actually reassess the situation and determine if food is what you really need in that moment. My other personal tip is to focus on gratitude. And I know it probably sounds corny, but I really think that there is something to it. I like watching Japanese cooking channels and I notice that before they sit down to eat, generally you'll always hear them say this one thing. Itadakimasu. If you like anime, you've probably heard this word said quite often as well. This word actually translates to I humbly receive. And from what I could gather from random websites and random videos, it's about extending gratitude to all beings that were involved in the preparation of the meal, from the animal that died, to the farmer, to the supermarket workers, to the chefs. Stopping to really reflect on all it takes for that plate of food to appear before you can really help you to feel more appreciative and take your time to really enjoy the meal. Again, not to sound like a broken record, but it comes back to pausing and being mindful in the experience of eating. Once you're better able to differentiate between emotions and hunger cues, deal with difficult emotions in ways that don't involve food, and actually give your brain a chance to be redirected towards more conscious decision making instead of always going down the path of automatic behaviors, you'll see a change in your overall eating habits. And do remember to be patient with yourself. All right, and that brings me to the end of this video. Take care.